call and response, call and responses. I'm going to talk to you and I'm, I'm expecting you to respond back. How many of you guys are familiar with the research writing process? And Jalen, I know you're not physically avail available, but type it in comments. So my guys that are in the actual uh, Carnegie, how many of you are familiar with what it means to write a research paper? Okay, so nobody's ever, you guys have never had to write a research paper before. Okay, I got one person that has. Okay, that's a good start. Uh, so, so just in case you guys haven't noticed, the research paper writing process in college is a little bit different than a research paper writing process in high school. What usually happens is when you start writing a research paper in um High school, usually the teacher will only um, ask you to have about three or four sources, and there's not a whole lot about the style of documentation that is talked about, or either the process itself, right? But when you get to college and you take college composition, a lot of times the teachers are asking more, and it actually is a process. How many of you have noticed that your teachers are asking for more details when you're writing your college level papers. Have we noticed that or do you think it's about the same as high school? Say it again, cause I can't hear you. Say it for me. I noticed it. Okay, so you noticed that it's a, it's a difference, right? So the difference being that when you write these papers on a collegiate level, what the teachers, what your professors are really, really looking for is what they, what they really want to see is your ability to synthesize the information that you found. They want to see your ability to synthesize the information that you found. And so what that means is the research that you find, they want to see how you use that information to back up whatever your opinion is, but also explain the information in context. Let me see how I move this out of the way so I could start. Okay. So what we want to do is we want to identify and examine the components that make up a college level research writing assignment, right? Because usually when you're writing this research paper, they're not just asking for a paper, but there are a couple of other assignments attached. Usually, I'll give an example. Before I would ever have my students write a research paper, they usually would have to do what I would call a research prospectus, right? And in their research prospectus, what I'm trying to see is, do they understand the assignment? So that means they may start the paper with, uh, by giving me a working topic, right? Which is a subject area of their paper, a working thesis, which means that that, that particular, uh, their opinion that is gonna be argued in the paper because the research paper is never an informative paper. The research paper is always your opinion on an issue that is backed up by expert opinion and other evidence that proves what you believe is correct. And that's how I want you to think of a research paper. I'm gonna repeat that again. A research paper is never just an informative paper, right? Nobody's gonna ask you to write a research paper on abortion. Everybody knows what abortion is. Nobody's ever going to uh, ask you to write a research paper about the economy. Everybody knows what's happening in the economy. When you're asked to write a research paper, your teacher is usually asking you to make a stance, meaning give your opinion about a particular issue and back that opinion up with outside sources that help validate the point that you're trying to make. For example, Let's say, give me one of the names of the students that are present. Give me one of the names of, of you guys. Brother, pick the drink up. What's your name? Ashan. Ashan. Okay. So let's say Ashan is taking uh, Dr. Holland's class, and Dr. Holland gives the topic because 
that when the teacher gives a topic, you still have to give your point of view on the topic. So let's say that she gives the topic of um, historically black colleges, right? So what she's asking you is, what is your opinion on historically black colleges? And when you do your research, you're gonna have to validate what your opinion is. So let's say that I shine takes the topic historically black colleges and he decides he's going to write about uh, historically black colleges are no longer relevant because we live in an integrated society, right? That's his opinion. That's his opinion. So now what it is Ashan's job to do is to find information that validates his point of view. Now it is his job as a researcher to find information that validates his point of view. But in order for that to happen, you have to have a plan to execute this paper. Okay, so the, there are three stages of the writing process. There are three stages of the writing process. The first stage is pre-writing. Who wants to tell me what pre-writing is? What does it mean to pre-write? Say it again for me. Draft. It's, draft. it's like draft. It's like a draft. Okay, okay. Kind of, kind of. Anybody want to add to what Ashan is saying? What else will we say about the pre-writing stage of a paper? Uh, is it like about to uh, put in the format now of how you want your paper to be like the outline? The outline is part of it. The outline is part of it, sis. So I thank you for that. But the pre-writing phase is when we're sort of brainstorming ideas that we're going to write about the paper, right? But the outline, so you are correct. The outline is part of that, right? But before anything happens, we've got to brainstorm. We got to think about all the ideas that come along with this topic so that we can make sure that our paper is going to have clarity and focus. The second part of the writing process is the actual writing itself, right? So after we've done the brainstorming and we created an outline, like my good sis said, now we want to actually start writing because we've got an outline that has given us a format for what the paper is supposed to include and what this uh, paper is supposed to look like. So now I can actually start writing paragraphs and one of the best things that you can ever do when you're writing a research paper, right? Is to first write the actual paper itself, right? Write the actual, what your point of view is on, on the issue that you're writing about. In this case, we said that Ashan is writing about uh, that historically black colleges are no longer relevant. So he's writing this whole essay about how historically black colleges are no longer relevant. And let's say he came up with the working thesis that historically black colleges are no longer relevant because racism no longer exists. Um, it does not adequately prepare black students to deal uh, in a diverse society and um, they do not have enough funds to expose students to real world training. So those are his three points that he's going to argue in the paper. Notice I never said, I think, I feel, I believe in this paper, I will show you how somebody tell me why I never said those things as I was making those points. It, why did I never say, I think, in my opinion, historically black colleges are no longer relevant because I think that they shouldn't exist because I feel, or in my opinion, why did I never, why should those things not be included in my paper? Why should those things not be included in a college level essay? Okay, those things, well, let me, let me just clarify, those things should never be said, because what happens is, when you start saying, I think, I feel, I believe, in my opinion, what you do is you create an automatic bias in your reader.
right? And so my sis that was helping me out in the beginning that talked about the outline, what's your name? Taylor, I don't have a question. Say it again. I don't have a question no more. No, but I'm saying, what's your name? Taylor. Taylor, okay. So let's say that what happens is if Taylor's reading this paper, right? And this is supposed to be a scholarly paper. Scholarly papers should always be written from a third person objective point of view. Because when you use first person pronouns, what happens is people who are reading this paper automatically become biased. Well, why, he, why does he feel like that? Who is he supposed to be? Is he an expert on something? And so when you take out those first person pronouns and you use third person point of view, it takes away what could be seen as bias. Because the point of a research paper is for you to give a scholarly opinion, not a personal opinion, okay? So the, again, the point of a research paper is for you to give a scholarly opinion, not a personal opinion. So that means your paper needs to be written from a third person perspective. The third part and the last part of the writing process is post writing. This is where I go back. Now, when I write the paper, if I go back and I get the information and the research that I found and I plug it in certain areas to help my paper have that, that, scholarly, that scholarly presence that my teachers are looking for. But also when I'm plugging in these statistics, these facts, these expert quotes, I make sure that I put them in my paper in such a way that I explain how it furthers what I've already tried to say. I have to explain how the information that I include furthers what I'm trying to say. For example, if I, if Taylor's writing a, pa a paper that talks about why abortion needs to end, abortion should, uh, should be stopped. Um, and she comes and she says that 70% of abortions are had by African-American women then that's a good piece of evidence. But the teacher wants to know, the teacher's going to want to know while reading this paper, what does this have to do? What does this evidence have to do with the point that you're trying to make? So if your opinion is, is that abortion should be stopped, and then you bring this piece of evidence that says 70% of abortions are had by African-American women, you need to make sure you explain the context of that information. So you may say something to explain that. You make sure that you say something along the lines of, it seems that abortion clinics and abortion doctors are targeting African-American communities. In fact, statistics say 70% of abortions are had by African-American and Latino women. These high, and so next, the next thing I do after I use this piece of evidence is I, is I explain what this has to do with my point. These high statistics suggest that Black women may often be targeted uh, for abortion, and this targeting of Black women may lead to the genocide of African American people if continued at this rate. So what I'm doing is I'm now explaining what I think this evidence means in context to what I'm trying to argue in my research paper because a research paper should only ever do two things. It should argue a point, right? Make a strong, a, a strong opinion about something or the other type of research paper is a literary analysis paper where in one of your English classes or your sociology classes, you may be reading something where you're expected to use outside sources to prove that what your opinion is about this particular uh, um, understanding of the book is, is true. So you're using outside sources to prove this point of view. All right, assignment clarification, assignment clarification. When you're doing a research paper and you've been given an assignment by your professor, you gotta make sure you understand what's being asked of you. You don't wanna just do something to turn a paper in so you can you know, uh, not fail the class or so you can get a decent grade. You wanna make sure that you're turning in uh, your best work and that you follow directions. 
you want to make sure that you're turning in your best work and that you follow directions. So the first thing you got to do is you got to make sure you read the directions that, a that the teacher has given you. Understand the directional statements, right? So it usually will start, the assignment may start with one of these four words where it says define, identify, analyze, or argue, right? Um, define simply means that you're explaining how a process works or you're explaining something. Identify means that you're, uh, you're tasked with finding how something works or finding the components of a thing. Analyze simply meaning that you're looking below the surface to find out what the deeper meaning of something is. Argue, you're taking a stance on an issue. And by stance, I mean, your particular perspective is being relayed through your uh, research paper, but you're finding outside information to back up what your uh, opinion or point of view is. The next thing you wanna do is you wanna make sure that you are aware of what the due date is and give yourself a things to do list based on the due dates. Because the worst thing you could do, especially as you transition from being a high school to a college writer, the worst thing you could do is do a paper at the last minute. Why would I say somebody, the worst thing you could do is do a paper at the last minute when you're coming from a high school to college? Why would that be a bad thing? Because like the paper would be rushed and it's like you didn't really go over it, you just put anything in it. It's like <laughs> you start Taylor finish. Go ahead. Jira. Jira. I heard some of it, but then it faded out. It faded out. I thought she was recapping. Recap it for me, Taylor, and say it a little bit louder because I think the echo in Carnegie is horrible. So say it for me again. Um, I said the paper was like, it's going to be rushed and you didn't put a lot of effort into it and just do anything on the paper. Okay, very good. Very much so. And also, as we discussed before, College level papers are much more detailed than high school papers. The expectation is always going to be greater. You know, so in high school, an essay for your teacher may have been one page. Sometimes they may even let you get away with writing one huge paragraph. When you come to college, the expectation is that you know how to write a at least a five paragraph paper. And they're not talking about a paragraph with three or four sentences. They're talking about detailed paragraphs that have topic sentences, that elaborate upon points, have closing statements, and have outside sources to validate what, what, you, what you are saying in your paper. That means you got to take your time to write this because we already know that the expectation is going to be greater. And because the expectation is going to be greater, we need to make sure that we take our time and do this correctly, okay? Next thing, identify the evaluation criteria. Make sure that whenever your teacher gives you an assignment that you're clear about what the rubric is. Um, who can tell me what a rubric is? A rubric? Um, like plan. Maybe, um, it, right? It's a what now? Say it again for me. <laughs> a rubric is like, like plenty of essay, right? No, not quite. A rubric is basically where the teacher gives you a guide that tells you what it's going to take to get an A, what it's going to take to get a B, what constitutes a C and what, what a failing paper does, right? They're giving you a guide that lets you know, um, essentially what it's gonna to take to get each grade, each letter grade. So they may say on the rubric, a, a paper has to be three to five pages, have a clear topic sentence, clear thesis statement, and use at least five outside sources. A B paper does X, Y, Z. So, 
you want to make sure that you look at the rubric because what happens is the rubric is going to tell you what is necessary to get not just a passing grade, but to successfully complete the assignment. Last thing you want to do is you want to make sure that you ask questions. You got to ask questions, folks, because uh, if I can use a, a Southern euphemism, a euphemism means simply um, a term that is used, a term, it's like a term of endearment, but it's like a metaphor that people say. So the euphemism that we use down South a lot is a closed mouth, don't get fed. Essentially what that means is if you don't ask questions, the teacher does not know that you, that you have a problem, right? And you cannot wait until the assignment is due to tell the teacher, uh, well, I didn't understand what you were saying. I didn't understand what you were asking me. It's too late then. The grade is already going to be given, okay? I'll give you a perfect example. I remember when I was teaching, after everything that I say, and I still, because I taught so long, I still have the same habit. After everything that I explain, the next thing that I do, I say, does anybody have any questions? I do that, I do that to a degree that some people in casual conversation, they're like, no, I don't have a question. I do it calculated methodically and I do it persistently. So that means if you didn't ask me when I kept asking, that means you understood the assignment. So if you come to me at the last minute saying, well, I didn't understand what you were saying, boo, you have to take that grade. Whatever it is, you're gonna have to take that L, right? Because what happens also is this is the other thing that we've got to understand about college, right? You've got to understand that as adults, when guidelines are given, you either follow the guideline or you get left behind. And so when the teacher is giving you class time to ask questions and you choose not to ask, what you're saying to that teacher is, I understand, I know what I'm doing and I got it. So because you have said that by default, the grade that you get is the grade that you earned. Everybody's still following me. And I'm saying these things to you because you got to know how college professors work, right? And I see my friend, um, Miss, is it Dr. Godbolt? No. Professor <laughs> Godbolt, Miss Godbolt. We see Miss Godbolt. Godbolt. <laughs> okay. We see her nodding her head because this is true. Because the truth of the matter is if I explain, if I use class time to explain it to you, I don't have additional time for you to come to my office and think I'm going to give you a personal tutoring session. It just can't happen. I got so many other students that I have to attend to. And you might say, well, dang, but that's real. And this is why sometimes it may seem that certain professors get irritated because it's like this whole class time, you didn't say a word, but when the assignment was due, now you're asking me questions. You want to make sure even the things you don't understand, ask them in the moment. The moment you realize that you don't understand, ask the teacher the question. Miss so-and-so, Dr. So-and-so, can you clarify for me? Can you give me some more information? Is it possible that I could see you during your office hours to talk to you uh, about X, Y, Z? Is it possible that I could come show you what I already have beforehand? Because if you wait until the last minute, again, you're going to have to take that L. All right, so we kind of went over the time management skills, talking about how you have to uh, set aside time to do the paper and you can't wait till the last minute. The next thing we want to do is we want to use what I like to refer to, because uh, I, I love scholarly language. I think that if folks pay for college, they ought to come out sounding like they went to college, okay? Because if you come out sounding like the folks that you were at home with, that, that's kind of problematic because you're paying a whole lot of money to change mindsets because college is more than just getting a piece of paper. There should be something about you that is different. So one of the things, a, a word that I love that is very, very appropriate here is a word called metacognition, right? Guys in the room uh, in Carnegie, say that for me, say metacognition. metacognition. Say it like, say it like you're meaning that because I could be watching Netflix. 
So uh, since I'm here, I'm gonna need some, I'm gonna need a little enthusiasm. So everybody say metacognition. Metacognition. Okay, so and I'm gonna need y'all to love this because I'm doing this because I love y'all. I ain't getting paid for this, all right? But I want you to learn how to do a good research paper and that's why I'm giving you energy, okay? So you know how you say on this, you know how we say uh, return the same energy? Notice I'm not talking to you like this. I don't want to be in the same. So give me the same energy I'm giving you. So metacognition simply means that I'm thinking about how I think, right? I'm thinking about how I think. So one of the metacognitive practices that I always use whenever I'm doing anything, especially research, I think, what do I already know about this topic? You see at the top, it says previous knowledge, right? Previous knowledge is very, very important, right? And it is a metacognitive practice. So we want to think, what do I already know about this particular topic? Because sometimes we don't make enough use of what we already know about things because that can help us further expand on or expound upon. And I want y'all to start saying that. Do me a favor. Throw piggyback out the window. Piggyback is a word that makes me itch. I hate that word with every fiber of my being. Uh, as scholars, we want to say elaborate upon, expound upon. Uh, nobody's really riding a pig's back, and it really has nothing to do with elaborating on information. So put that in our vocabularies. Expound upon, elaborate upon. So you want to make sure that you think about what previous information do I already know about this topic? Because when you start to go back, most of this stuff you've already sort of become familiar with. You may not know everything about it, but you're slightly familiar with some of these things. So use that familiarity to go further. The next thing you want to do is you want to think about the content of the course. How you write in your literature courses is going to be a little bit different than how you write, or it's going to be a lot different, I'm sorry. It's going to be a lot different than how you write in your, let's say, your science courses or your, so, your sociology and psychology courses, right? You say, well, Dr. Hall, how are they different? When you write in a literature course, and I'm going to put this in the chat, you're going to use what is called MLA style documentation. When you write in a literature course, you're going to use what is called MLA style documentation. Okay. When you write in a psychology or sociology course, you're going to use what is called APA style documentation. Why is this important? Because whenever you use information that did not come out of your brain, right? When you get these facts, these statistics, these expert opinions, you've got to document it within the context of your paper. Otherwise, your teacher is going to say, and rightfully so, that you are plagiarizing. Okay? And we know that's a big bad word in college because plagiarizing, it used to get people expelled. I don't, I think people do it so much now that now what it gets you is failed grades. OK, so let's say that you decide to turn in the paper and even though because ignorance is never an excuse. And I'm telling you that now, because as scholars, we're expecting you to do a little bit more than the average Joe. So even if the teacher didn't tell you about documenting your sources, you as a scholar, when you looked up research paper, you saw something about documentation. And that's got to be used. So if you decide, well, I found this on the Internet, I'm putting my paper, she's not going to know. Let me tell you something. <laughs> and I'm going to share some with y'all that sometimes 18 to 19 year olds don't believe, right? I'm going to use another Southern euphemism. Sometimes y'all don't believe that fat meat is greasy. Let me tell you what that means. <laughs> what happens is you think you pulled a fast one because you found a paper on the internet is that is very much Akin, I know you guys haven't done that, but you've seen this happen, right? You've seen your homegirl or your homeboy do this. They pull a paper off the internet that is, you know, oh, I found this good paper. I don't even have to write it. I'm just going to download, change a couple of words. Do y'all have a friend 
that you know is not the brightest light bulb in the box. And then they turn in this paper that's written, written like Shakespeare wrote it. Have y'all ever seen a friend do that before? I shine say, mm hmm. Okay, so I shine. If I already is your teacher, because I've heard you speak, or I've seen your other work, right? So I know you're not the. I know that you're not the kind of person that knows uh, to put two slices of bread on the sandwich. Okay, that all all the tools are not in the picnic basket. Do you think that I'm thinking that all of a sudden you're gonna start writing like Shakespeare? No, I know you didn't. So what I'm going to do, as most teachers do, is I'm going to run this paper through one of the many devices on the internet, okay? Because what happens is sometimes when you get people that cheat, you know, I'm, I'm sure you heard your mother, your grandmothers and your mother say before, say it before, if you are cheat, you lie. If you lie, you steal. If you steal, you kill, right? So what happens is, is that if you cheat, I already know you're going to lie and say you didn't cheat. So what happens is now I got to run this paper through one of these apps like uh, cheatpapers.com or I take a line from the paper and I Google it and whatever reference or source you use to plagiarize the paper automatically comes up. So now not only are you looking at an F, but you could be looking at possible disciplinary action. So you want to make sure, is everybody still following me? You want to make sure that you're getting to a place that when you write the paper, you're writing the paper. And whatever wow. you borrow from another source, that you document that source. Because if not, again, that's plagiarism. Is this making wow. sense so far, guys? I think that the disciplinary is kind of I shine, I hear you, and I think people in hell want ice water, but that, that doesn't happen. Uh, if you cheat, that goes against scholarly principles, because when you came to college, you came to college, and the assumption that was made there, what you, what you, si what you signed on to do was to become a scholar, not to cheat. And so when you steal other people's intellectual property, because that's what it is, you're stealing other people's intellectual property, then that becomes a problem. And we have to, we have to guess, should this person still be here? Because it's clear what happens. So we've got to make sure that we're doing the work. We're doing the work. And bigger than that, guys, one of the things, um, I went to a retention conference this week, and one of the things that they talked about in the retention conference is 90% of companies are looking for college graduates that can write, right? But unfortunately, many of these companies are seeing college graduates who still don't have basic level writing skills. So this is bigger than just what your college composition teacher is asking. This is bigger than you writing a research paper in your sociology class. When you get into corporate America, even if you're an entrepreneur and you have to write a business plan, writing skills are essential. And it can't be somebody else writing for you. It has to be you, right? It has to be you writing these things. Okay, so when you're selecting the next part of the paper that we want to talk about is topic selection, topic selection. When you're writing the paper, you need to make sure that you're asking the appropriate questions. Asking the appropriate questions. Uh, what is this topic similar to? Has this been written about too much? Are there too many people writing about the same thing, right? Um, because there are three topics that teachers hate to read. And I feel bad that I mentioned one of them already, but three topics that teachers hate to read about. And that's because we've read them so much. Anything about abortion, the death penalty, and the legalization of marijuana. Nobody wants to read it because it's been talked about so many times. So you want to make sure that you pick a strong topic that you can really argue uh, a point about 
or prove something about that has not been talked about by a whole lot of people, especially a whole lot of people in your class. So the other questions that you need to ask are, what is it similar to? What are the causes of this? What are the consequences of this particular thing? What is the essential function? Uh, what is the history of this of this particular thing? What is the present status? What case can be made for or against it? How did it happen? Why did it happen? And what is my reaction to it? Now, within the context of the paper, let's say, for instance, um, that Mr. Ghana is a student and he's going to write a paper about defunding the police. If he's going to write a paper about defunding the police, that's a really, really controversial topic because not a lot of people believe that money should be taken away from police departments. But he's saying that uh, more community policing, and we've heard people talk about that, but he's going to really write about that. And he's maybe talks about how it impacts people from a particular area and why more money should be taken away from police departments and given to community centers, okay? And so in making a case for that, he may talk about how um, because of the, 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 the numerous amounts of money that are given to police departments, schools are suffering, uh, community programs are suffering when they could be benefiting from that same money that is used to lock up young black and Latino men, right? So this is his case, this is his argument. But when making that, he has to also do what it's called play the devil's advocate. Who can tell me what it means to play the devil's advocate? Okay, who can tell me what it means to play the devil's advocate when writing a paper? So nobody, okay. So when I'm playing the devil's advocate, what that simply means is that I, as a scholar, as a researcher, have agreed to look at something from two perspectives. I'm still arguing my point of view, but I want to make sure that I include the opposing perspective in my paper. I want to make sure that I include the opposing perspective in my paper so that my reader will understand that I've looked at all, I looked at all the sides of this issue, but I still believe that my particular point of view, which I'm arguing is the correct one. You said, well, Dr. Hall, how does that happen? When uh, Mr. Ghana is writing this paper about police brutality, and in it, he says, many people believe that if we take away funding from the police, that that means less police officers, and that's possibly so. The lessening of police officers may mean higher crime in some areas. That's him looking at the issue from the other side, but it also becomes his job to go back and still make sure that he proves his point. That does not mean that I'm going to make a neutral paper. Because if I've got a neutral paper, a paper that consistently argues two sides, right? If I'm arguing both things throughout and says that I'm for defunding the police, but I'm really not for defunding the police, then what I have is a neutral paper. That's not an argumentative or it's not a research paper because no particular point of view is made. So we got to make sure that while we include the opposing side, we're still arguing why our paper or why our point of view is more right. Can anybody give me an example of what that looks like in real life? How do we do that? How do we talk about an opposing point of view, but still prove that our point is right? Just as a swimming. Okay, thank you. Um, so I want to wrap this up because many of these things we already going over. So I'm going to wrap this up and I want to end this with things that you need to do to make sure that your research paper come together 
to explain the information that you wanted to explain and make sure that you are thoroughly covering the points of view that your teacher has talked about. So we talked about in the beginning how you want to make sure that you understand the assignment, right? Make sure that you understand the assignment. So if the teacher has given you a list of topics to choose from, make sure that you understand that even though you're choosing a topic, you've got to have a point of view about the topic. So it's not enough to just pick um, Donald Trump, right? If she has Donald Trump on the list, what about Donald Trump? And so that is for you as a scholar to have a point of view about, uh, uh, about Donald Trump and write a paper based on that point of view. Number two, make sure that that paper is written from a third person perspective. There should be no, I think, I feel, I believe, in my opinion, I will show you how. Those are things that happen in middle school and college. Your paper should be written from a third person perspective. Number three, when you start the paper, you wanna make sure that you brainstorm first. You wanna brainstorm first. That means that I write down everything that is related to that topic that I already know. Again, that's one of those metacognitive strategies that we talked about is I need to think about how I'm thinking. What do I already know about this? So in the brainstorming process, I'm gonna write that down. As Taylor said, also after we finish brainstorming, we want to make sure that we create an outline. The outline is going to be the map for our paper that shows how we provide clarity and focus and stay on topic as we're writing this paper. Next, we want to have what's called a draft. A draft is when we begin to write in chunks of the text. We continuously refer back to the thesis so that we're staying on, the tra on track. So if my thesis said that um, the death penalty should be ended because one, two, and three. Then my first body paragraph should be about one. My second body paragraph should be about two. My third body paragraph should be about three. It should not devi deviate from what my thesis said. Number three, I want to make sure I integrate information from sources even as I'm writing. And when I integrate that information at those outside sources, I gotta make sure that I cite the source at the end of the sentence before the period. I gotta make sure that I cite the source at the end of the sentence before the period, okay? Last thing, we wanna make sure that we move from point to point and not author from author. So stop. Uh, make sure you finish explaining point one before you move on to point two. Because what we want to make sure we have is a paper that is logical to understand and it has an easy flow. Does anybody have any questions about anything that I explained to you so far? Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to send this to, um, I'm going to send this particular PowerPoint to Mr. Ghana. And you guys can use it for when you have, because I'm sure as we're winding up the semester, there'll be paper assignments that you guys have to do, a large paper assignments, end of, end of semester paper assignments. And so I'm going to send this PowerPoint to him and you can refer back to it to help you with uh, your last paper assignment or whatever it is that you're doing. And so I thank you for your time and your attention. And I beg of you, whenever you show up, show up.